to ask that you would comfort them the knowledge that that we can have a Savior and that, that we can look forward to heaven. That we can trade in these old frail bodies that are not only racked with pain at times, but also racked with an old nature for new and renewed lives. We can be with you forever. Help us to look forward to that day by day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to call your attention to the bulletin for a few of the announcements. And, of course, we are having our um, annual meeting today. And so, from what I understand, if you want to get a cup of coffee or a, a donut or something, but come back into the sanctuary as soon as you can, and we'll, we'll have our annual meeting. The call committee is going to be uh, meeting here at church, 415. And then uh, going up to uh, the AFLC to talk with uh, some of the um, interns that will be available for a call. And so be here at 415. Myron, is this correct? The Truth Project is at 645 still? Yes. Okay. You've learned how to be in two places at once, I suppose. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, just a uh, touch base on the Truth Project. Tomorrow night's subject is history. And uh, there's no time in my memory that history has been more in the news in the last six months. And if you want to get uh, the rest of the story as to God's view of history, uh, come. They're pretty much standalone units, and if you can make it tomorrow night and can't any other time, I would suggest that you, you come and, and watch the video and, and discuss the, the revisionist that's going on and what's wrong with it. So if you're not interested in history but want to see Myron being in two places at once, that would be even more interesting. Okay, and uh, then also we're having our Mission and Evangelism uh, Committee meeting on Tuesday, 7 o'clock. I think the rest is um, pretty much normal things that go on. Any other uh, announcements that should be made today? If not, we... Uh, Turn in our hymnal there for the uh, call to worship, and it's from Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Shall we uh, turn to hymn 292, The Church is One Foundation. The church is one foundation. I, I, I got that hooked up in typing. There's a difference. And it's, not, it's not the church is one foundation. It's the church is one foundation. That's Jesus Christ.
we bow our hearts and our heads and confess our sins. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the promise of forgiveness of sins. I thank you that we can find those promises sprinkled all throughout Scripture. And the only reason it's possible is because Jesus, our true foundation, has forgiven our sins by his life and death. I thank you for Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where, where you say, There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray that you would help us day by day just to hold on to these promises and know that we have found peace with God because of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture lessons for the day are uh, beginning with Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Shall we rise out of respect for the reading of God's word? The epistle lesson, Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. The Gospel lesson is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19, and this will be the uh, text for the message uh, today. Matthew 16, verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They say, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This ends our scripture lessons for today. Let us confess our holy Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You be seated. This time we'll ask the ushers to wait upon us for the morning hour. <coughs>
invite you to join us in our time of worship and praise. Our first song, uh, this is going back a little ways. Uh, I think I have, it was on a CD that I looked at that said the top 100 worship songs, and I guess I just missed this because I was only six years old, so uh, at the time. This is called For a Building a People of Power.
the uh, scripture lesson for today. So let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Jesus, today I pray that you would uh, cause us to see the importance of building our foundation upon you, trusting you, letting you empower us, and then, yes, going forth sharing your word with the world around us so that others might be able to be a part of that free gift that you've given us. And Jesus, today would you fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a usable gift to proclaim your word, Lord. Follow the truth and the option and the excitement that your word deserves. For we ask it in Building a building, what's the most important part of building a building? The foundation. You don't see it much, do you? But what happens if the foundation is bad? And uh, is it not turned on? It was turned on at one time. It is not now. Okay, is that better? Yeah, it's going to be. It's already working, right? Oh. <laughs> Why don't you just give me one of those handheld ones? That's the way I like it. <laughs> I've, I've been a part of building a few buildings, and uh, it seems like the slow process of building that foundation takes forever, but it's essential, isn't it? And I'm, I'm stepping out here because I want to see uh, if how washed out the next slide is, if you can actually see it. This is one of my favorite pictures here, and uh, you don't really see at the beginning until I zoom Daddy, in a little Daddy, bit what happened Daddy. there. <coughs> I took this picture, it's about 20 miles up from the uh, last church that we were at. And uh, can you see the uh, building there that didn't have any foundation or didn't have a good uh, foundation? And what happens? Eventually, it falls over. And Jesus is speaking to us in our portion of Scripture today, and, and he's saying the foundation of a church, the foundation of King of Glory needs to be solid. And we've looked at that portion of Scripture, and we, we think about uh, the question that uh, Jesus came. First he asked, who do people say to him that I am? But then he said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And what did Peter reply? You are the Christ, which really translated, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And what was Jesus' reply in all of that? On this foundation, or on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There can be no other foundation for the church apart from salvation in Jesus Christ. We can have lots of things going on, and some churches do. But if it's not based on Jesus Christ and salvation in Him, those other things are just frivolous and don't amount to much. Jesus made the statement that he will build his church on the foundation of what he has done for us. He will build our church here. Are we willing to believe that and allow him to do that to us? We're going to notice really three different things. First of all, uh, his desire to build the church his instruments in building the church, and his power in building the church. Now, I want you to think of, about the, uh, Christ's desire to build this church. He, he uses uh, parables, uh, small stories, illustrations all throughout the Gospels, and uh, he does that, and in every instance, he is trying to tell us that his church should grow numerically. I'm just going to mention a few of these uh, and notice that he's not impressed with fishing without catching in Luke 5, an empty banquet table in Luke 14, sowing without reaping in Matthew 13, a 
fig tree that bears no figs, Luke 13. Lost sheep that are not brought into the fold, Matthew 18. A lost coin that is sought but not found, Luke 15. Ripe harvests that are not reaped, Luke 9. And in all of these illustrations, what is he saying to us? He desires that people would come to Jesus Christ and come into the church, be a part of it. Not so much the church building, but into the church body. And in doing so, that they would spend eternity with him in heaven. He wants numerical growth, and he expects that there will be numerical growth. And so we turn now to the instruments in building Christ's church, and the first one it is the Word of God. As we think about the Word of God, over and over, the Scriptures tell us that the Word of God is the means that God uses to bring people to faith and to strengthen their faith. We notice Romans chapter 1, verse 16 simply says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience. As a youth, I went through it. It would be the same as what we think of as uh, confirmation. I think they called it catechism at the church that I went to. And uh, in the end, you were supposed to be able to stand up and say, yes, I have faith in God. I have faith in Jesus. But they didn't emphasize, it's not so much how much faith I can work up, but it's how much faith God gives me, and the very fact that he uses his word to implant that in us. I so much wanted to be able to say, yes, I trust in God, but I still had lots of questions. I kind of floundered for a number of years until eventually I started reading God's word every day. What does that do in our life? Reading God's word every day. It changes you from within because it is the gospel that causes you to believe. It is the gospel that causes you to have faith and it strengthens your faith as well. And then, and only then, did I come to a place where I had assurance because God's word was working as a means of grace. The Word of God is so important. It's important for you to, to read it on your own personally. It's also important for you to be in God's house listening to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, verse 21 simply says, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, it is foolishness to preach at people, isn't it? Have you ever preached at your kids? You kids, have you ever had your parents preach at you? It's foolishness, isn't it? But God uses it to change our lives when the Word of God is included with it. Through the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. Second, the Word of God, we notice, is the Holy Spirit. Christ promised that the church would be built on the power of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, those last few words were the words that he spoke before he went off to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. We read this as our portion of scripture for our epistle reading. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after that, he was taken up into heaven. They would receive power as the Holy Spirit came upon them. So they waited for the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon all believers. The scriptures tell us that everyone who is trusting in Christ has the gift of the Holy Spirit. How does God use the Holy Spirit in our lives to build up the church? John chapter 16 verse 7 speaks to us very plainly. 
And there Jesus, speaking about the fact that he was going to go to heaven and was going to send the Holy Spirit, he says, I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. How does that work? Convicts us of our sins. Did you realize every one of us is a desperate sinner? The more I read God's word, the more the Holy Spirit works in my life and shows me. I don't measure up. How about you? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and explains to us very clearly that sin leads to judgment. But also that good news, that there is a righteousness that can be had. Not what we can do, but what God, what Jesus has done for us. It causes us to know that yes, Jesus has forgiven our sins and given us the righteousness that we need so that we can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, it convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment. The next thing that we think about is prayer. Jesus has promised to build his church and he does so in response to the prayer of his people. Paul realized the importance of prayer and reliance upon the power of God. And uh, as he wrote to the, the Colossian church, he explained that, first of all, he was praying for them and asked them to be praying for him. Listen to what it says. And, and I wish I prayed prayers for you as wonderful and specific as, as Paul prayed. Listen to his prayer first in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. He says, since the day that we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom. He wanted them to understand God's will and to have all spiritual wisdom. He says, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience and may joyfully give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. What a prayer. If we could say to each other, I've been praying for you, and this is what I've been praying. God builds up his church through the prayers of his people. Let's be praying not only for each other, but for those that are outside of the doors of King of Glory. And then Paul turns around and he asks them to pray for him. In chapter 4, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. You know, here he's sitting there in jail. He's in chains for declaring the mystery of Christ, and he's begging them, would you pray for me so that I can do it even more and be more effective in doing it? I used to have a family that would come to church. Uh, I think you know the Olsons. Most of you know Kevin and Pam Olson. And uh, they would come into church, and they would say, on the way to church this morning, we prayed for you, Pastor, just like we always do. And uh, to know that people are praying that I might explain the Word of God in a bold way and so that people's lives would be changed. Jesus builds his church with uh, the power, his power, in response to our prayers. I'm going to just stop here for a moment because there's this one guy that uh, many of you probably prayed for. Uh, some of you know him, or you know him better than most. Uh, do you remember Jared? 
Some of you are shaking your head back and forth. The rest of you might remember when I, um, Kathy and Maury hired Jared to uh, sign for CJ and uh, Jessica as they went through confirmation. Jared came in, he looked to me just like one of the Beatles of the, uh, the 70s. After, you know, this was after their clean cut days or, and, you know, long hair, wearing black, and, uh, you know, just uh, little squinty glasses. And, and he says, Pastor, I'm not a Christian. I don't, I'm not a believer. But I, I will guarantee you this. I will faithfully tell CJ and Jessica what you're saying. Well, he was under the word of God. He was hearing the, the word of God, and people were praying for him. And before long, guess what happened with Jared? God answered their prayers. I mean, he was stuck, wasn't he? He had to hear the word of God at least twice a week, because he had to come to confirmation, and they had to take notes on what I was saying, and so he had to come to church, and he had to listen, too, because... He was translating it to them. He went and eventually ended up going to fly and was the translator for the, the sessions at fly as a believer. So God was working in response to people's prayers. We think about Peter and John, and uh, you know it seems like they got thrown into prison on a number of occasions, and they had been speaking boldly about Christ, and they were thrown into to jail and. Uh, by the power of prayer and God, they were released. and They were told, uh, actually threatened, don't speak the name of Jesus anymore. Do you think that stopped them? It didn't stop them much, did it? They went back to the believers, and what do you think they did? They, they got down on their knees and they prayed. And, and this is what it says about that prayer. It says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to... Speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders through your name and the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They went right back out and did it again, didn't they? Prayer. So we looked at the, uh, the instruments, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, prayer. There's one final one that I'd like to mention that uh, is uh, included here, and that is His people. Jesus uh, uses us in building up His church. We think of that Great Commission that was, was read uh, uh, so many times, or it's been read in, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 21. And, Jesus came to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am always with you to the very end of the age. There's a couple of things that we notice here in this. Number one, God wants to use people in building up his church. He told them to go and to witness to people. The second thing is he's promised to be there with us as we go. The one who, it says, had all authority in heaven and on earth is here to be with us as we share that amazing word of God. Two things that we noticed in all of that. Today we've noticed that Christ does desire to build up his church, and we thought about the instruments, but now let's think about the, the power to build his church. Uh, Christ promised to build his church uh, through his power. Verse 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The power of Christ is with us. Here in King of Glory, to build his church. And that power is so great that even hell's gates cannot prevail.
prevent us from reaching into hell and pulling people back. You remember the fact that gates, are they offensive or defensive instruments of war? They're defensive, aren't they? And we're on the offense, and it says there, hell's gates won't even be able to stand against the power of Christ when we use it to reach in and grab souls and bring them out of a destiny towards hell and towards pointing towards heaven. That power is here for us as we depend on what Christ can do rather than what we can do. The unfortunate thing is, at least for me, I always look at the things I can't do. Did you ever, are you that way? What do you think I look at on a Sunday morning? I'm too old to do this. <laughs> I'm in too much pain to even get out of bed, let alone come and do something like this. There's a whole list of reasons why I shouldn't be able to do it. And how do we, what do we usually focus on? On me. And our focus instead needs to be on what God has promised that he will do through us. Psalm 127 speaks about building and reminds us to depend upon him and let him provide. It says there, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for while they sleep, he provides for those that he loves. He will take care of them. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says, it's not going to be by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Unfortunately, too many churches and too many people refuse to believe that Jesus will give this kind of power to his church. I want to close with just this one illustration and one thought. Do you remember the Israelites in the Old Testament? God had promised uh, to take them out of Egypt and bring them into into the promised land, didn't he? And that they were supposed to just go in and take it. And so they got to the edge, and uh, God actually told them, send in some spies, but the spies went, and, and they looked around, and what happened? Most of those spies brought back a very discouraging report. Oh, yes, they carried the fruit that was so large that it took two of them to carry it on one pole. They said there was a great, great amount of a goodness in this land, but the people are large. And we looked like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. And they discouraged the people from going in. And you know, that same truth can be seen in churches, can't it? Looks like a very uninviting world out there. You know, I have the advantage of looking out the doors all the way out into the street. Ah, we look like grasshoppers in those people's eyes. We surely wouldn't want to go up to their door and talk to them about Jesus. Or our friends at work, or our family members. But God promises to be with us. What happened 40 years later? All of the people except for the two spies that, that didn't have a discouraging report, Caleb and Jacob, or Caleb and Joshua, had died. And now Joshua and Caleb lead them into the promised land. The first city, Jericho, a walled city, closed up tight. And what were they supposed to do? Were they supposed to take it up there with their own strength? March around it. And on the last day, blow a trumpet and have a shout. And what happened? Did they have to tear the walls down so they could go in and take the city? They didn't. No, God was able to take care of it for them. And I'm on 
honestly believe that as we think about King of Glory, that we need to just take God up on his promises. Each one of us. <coughs> we can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it in his power. And we can urge the world for Jesus, even from right here. Lord God, today I pray that you would help us to take our focus off of ourselves and all the reasons why we couldn't do something. And place our focus and our, our eyes upon your strength, your promises, your Holy Spirit that lives and works in us and allow us to stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ and build the church here that is constantly bringing you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pick up our hymnals and turn in the, the hymnal to hymn number 607, Be Thou My Vision. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We 
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.